Shalom brothers, in today's session we are going to be entering one of the most spectacular, amazing passages in the Bible, uh, Vayikra chapter 14. And uh, there are very few uh, Bible commentators, scholars who have unfolded uh, the, the amazing aspects given in, the, in this chapter, but still there is a lot that is left, there is a lot that is, that is yet unexplored. So in this session, through Lord's help, we are going to be unfolding and unlocking something uh, something extremely deep and that uh, you have never heard before. Uh, and that's, we are going to be doing that through Lord's help. Uh, the chapter contains 57 verses and uh, it has been uh, divided into, bifurcated into two sections. The first 32 verses speak of uh, what is the ritual that needs to be done when a person is, uh, is cleansed of Zarat. Zarat uh, is the Hebrew word which, which speaks of skin, infectious skin diseases. Now the most dangerous of them all is obviously leprosy. Uh, some versions have translated leprosy but the word is Zarat which contains a leprosy and other infectious skin diseases. Leprosy being the most dangerous of them all. And 33rd verse onwards till the end uh, is the ritual that needs to be done when a house is, is found to have been cleansed uh, which, which earlier had defiling mold, mildew, uh, a house having zarat. Uh, that the procedure is given over there for the house and the first 32 verses is for a person who has zarat, leprosy, any other uh, infectious skin disease. What we are going to be doing is we are going to be focusing on the first 20 verses because verses 10 to 20 are again explained in verses 21 to 32 wherein the only difference is that uh, it is for uh, the poor person who cannot offer a male lamb and, a, uh, and an e lamb for a sin and a burnt offering. So uh, a poor person who cannot afford this, he would be offering uh, the, the two turtle doves or two young pigeons for the sin and the burnt offering. That's the only difference. So the verses 10 to 20 are again explained in verses 21 to 32. So we will be focusing on the first 20 verses. And without further ado, uh, brothers, we, let's, just, let's just jump in. So Vayikra chapter 14, verse 1. Adonai said to Moshe, these are the regulations for any diseased person at the time of their ceremonial cleansing. When they are brought to the priest, uh, the priest is to go outside the camp and examine them. If they have been healed of their defiling skin disease, uh, the priest, the Kohen, shall order that two live clean birds and some cedar wood, a scarlet yarn and hyssop be brought for the person to be cleansed. Then the Kohen shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it together with the cedar wood, scarlet yarn and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was, all, that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of uh, the defiling disease and then pronounce them clean. After that he is to release the live bird in the open fields. Okay, so brothers, we have read from the NIV in, in uh, the videos that we have made up until now. We have, we have mostly uh, mentioned, uh, uh, read from the NIV. Uh, that doesn't mean that only the NIV is right. Uh, there are some other versions of wonderful, you know, the KJV, the NASV, the ASV. And in our previous sessions, we have, uh, whenever required, we have also uh, mentioned the other versions. So we are reading from the NIV, but you can read from the NASV and, and other versions as well. So getting back to the seven verses, so what is happening over here? Now, now uh, scholars say that uh, the bird, there are two birds over here, there are two clean birds and the person who has been uh, found, who is cleansed of Zarat, the, the priest examines the person and if he finds him to be clean, this ritual is to be, is, is, is to be done. Uh, there are two clean birds. Uh, the, the first bird is to be uh, killed, sacrificed and uh, it is, it is obvious and some scholars clearly understand that this bird is Christ. The first bird that is killed is Christ and the blood of this bird is, is it, it, it's taken into the, it's killed over uh, fresh water which is in a clay pot. So what uh, uh, certain, what people, what scholars believe is, and it's, it's right, what they do is uh, the clay pot, the fresh water, it's living water. Uh, and we know that our Mashiach, our Lord, is the fountain of living water. Yohanan 7 and other uh, verses from the Bible, we know that he is the fountain of living water. And when he talks about the clay pot, he says that we know from the scripture that we are made from dust. And now we are a new creation, wherein Paul says in 2 Corinthians that uh, we are uh, treasures in jars of clay. So scholars 
they 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 connect all of these things and three more things that I'm going to explain you right now that is cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop, which are connected with the live world. So the bird that is slaughtered, that is killed over fresh water, uh, is Christ, representing Christ. And uh, then what is done is that uh, the priest he takes the live bird, the other bird, and he dips it into the fresh water, into the water containing the blood of the bird that was slaughtered. And along with the live bird, he dips also the cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop. Uh, so uh, what's, uh, what this represents is that scarlet yarn, if you see throughout the Bible, you understand it's uh, given many times and main, it, it is focusing on the shedding of the blood of Christ. It is focusing on that. You see it throughout the scripture, even, even during uh, our Lord's uh, crucifixion, uh, when, the, when the Roman soldiers were mocking him, you find in the, in the accounts of the gospel, uh, it, it says that they, they, were, they were mocking him and they were making fun of him and uh, they made him to wear a purple robe but in the, ma in the account uh, by Matthew Yahu you find that the robe was also, it was a scarlet colored robe. So scarlet you find during Lord's crucifixion and it is focusing on the blood of Christ. Hyssop you understand we know from the, from the gospel account that before Lord gave up his ruach uh, he, he was thirsty and he was given uh, vinegar. Uh, the sponge of vinegar on top of the uh, stalk of a hyssop and then he, he takes the vinegar, he, he drinks it and then he, he says a tetelestai. Uh, and when you see hyssop throughout the scripture you understand that it, it is again it is connected to our Lord. It is connected to uh, ceremonial cleansing, it has uh, medicinal properties and when you see uh, uh, it's used in the purification process as it's used over here, even when the first Pesach, uh, Moshe tells uh, our ancestors in Mitzrayim to apply the blood of the, of the Pesach on the lintel and the mezuzot. And it was applied by using a hyssop. So there it is connected to, uh, to Christ, to our Mashiach. There are some scholars, there are some uh, Bible commentators who feel that, very few, who feel that the crown of thorns, the wood, the crown of thorns was made of cedar wood. Now nobody exactly knows what wood was used over there. But more than focusing on the crown, there are, a lot of, there are quite a few scholars who feel that uh, the wood that was used for the cross was made of cedar wood. But again, again, this is speculative. Uh, people, uh, we exactly nobody knows wh what was the wood that was used. Uh, some feel it was it was uh, oak wood. Some feel it was pine wood. Some feel it was acacia wood. Some feel it was dog wood. Some feel it was uh, it was uh, cedar wood. Some feel it was olive, uh, olive wood. So nobody knows exactly. Uh, there are scholars who tend to believe uh, the chances of the wood of could, uh, being acacia was very strong because acacia wood was used uh, in uh, the tabernacle, in the building of the tabernacle and in the Ark of the Covenant. But uh, no one exactly knows what was the wood. But when you study cedar wood, you, you realize that cedar wood was used in, in large quantities uh, when Shlomo got the first temple built. And even Jerubabel, uh, when he built the temple, cedar wood was used. So cedar is connected to the building of the temple and temple is connected to our Lord. So one, it is, it is in a way connected to the Mashiach. But scarlet yarn and hyssop are very strongly connected to, to Christ and they are, you, you find them in, during the crucifixion, uh, when the crucifixion is happening. So what the, the Kohen is doing over here is he is dipping the live bird along with uh, cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop in the blood and the fresh water and, and, and then he sprinkles it seven times. It says, the verse seven says, seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed uh, of the defiling disease. He sprinkles uh, the person to be cleansed seven times and that and after that he is to release the live bird in the open fields. Now see what happens brothers. There are, there are, there are, bro there are brothers, uh, scholars who feel that the bird that is uh, you know uh, released is, is released in the open fields is the resurrected Christ. It is the resurrected and, and, and ascending Christ. And uh, that is not wrong. It is, it is right. Uh, what they what they do is they they say this is Christ, which is right, but but they, there is a lot more over here that is happening. There is a lot more over here that everybody misses. See here here there are a few uh, photographs, uh, pictures of the bird being released. Uh, beautiful photos. 
and here I've kept the two birds. Okay, so what, what they do is they feel this is Christ and it is right. But there's a lot more over here, like I said. What we want to show you over here is that uh, there is something that happens in the New Testament. In the Gospel account, you find something that is very clearly happening. And this ritual is a graphic display, a visualization of actually something happening. That which you find in the Gospel, you find two persons. One person is, is the sinless one, the, the uh, guiltless one, uh, who is being sentenced to be crucified. And there is another person who is guilty, who is full of sin, who is uh, responsible for insurrection, who is a murderer. And by now, you have you surely understood who I'm talking about. There were two Yeshuas. One Yeshua, Melech HaYehudim, the king of kings, the king of the Jews. And there was another Yeshua, certain translations they don't have uh, Yeshua Barabba or Jesus Barabbas. They directly write, they only write Barabba. Uh, he's, he's known as Barabbas and the Hebrew word is Barabba. So, so there are two persons and listen to this very carefully what is happening over here. Uh, Barabba is guilty of insurrection and murder and he's a criminal. He is guilty, but the person who is guiltless, who is sinless, who is righteous, is sentenced to, to, to be crucified and Barabba is released. Barabba is released. This is a graphic display of this actual event that takes place. And, and there's a lot more over here. You need to understand that actually there was a person named Barabba. Actually there was a person. But what is the theological significance of that event? When we understand... It was not just Barabba who was released. Actually, there was a, such a person. Definitely, he was. But when you realize what Christ has done for us, we are the Barabbas. What is the meaning of Barabba? Bar means son. Ben means son. Bar also means son. And Abba means father. So, so the, the, he is Barabba means son of the father. And brothers and sisters, all you are, who are watching, all of you who are watching, you and I are the Barabbas who are full of guilt, who are, who are filled with sin. We are the murderers, we are the adulterers. And we have been released. And our Lord, the sinless one, the guiltless one, the righteous one, the pure one, the innocent one, he took the wrath of Lord, of the Father, that upon himself that we deserved. So we are Barabba and he took the wrath, he took the punishment, Yeshua took it and we have been released. That is what is happening, that is what is displayed over here in this ritual. And, and, and there's a lot more over there, there's still some, a, a few more things that I'm going to be explaining you to later in the session. We will be getting back to this ritual. We will get back to this ritual because... Uh, uh, there are a few more things that I, I, I really I need to show you. So the point is that, that we are the one who has been freed. And the bird that is, that is released, the bird is, is ascending, but the bird is also released. You read, when you read the words, it says, after that he is to release the live bird in the open fields. Now I'm not saying that it, the, the, the verse is not focusing on the ascension. It is focusing. It is. But it is also focusing on the bird being released. We are released. We have been freed from sin, from slavery to sin. We have, we, we are, we are now slaves of righteousness, slaves and servants of Christ. And there is nothing greater. The greatest thing ever is to be servant of Yeshua Ha Nazarati. So this is what is happening. But there's a, 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 some more very important things that I will be showing you later uh, in 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 a little while, in just a few minutes. You see, these are the photographs I have kept. Uh, of, of two persons representing the two birds and uh, Yeshua being sentenced to be crucified. And you see Barabba over there? That's us. That's us. There was actually a Barabba. Don't misunderstand me. Actually, there was a person. And Yeshua, the name Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua was a, a common name back then. Uh, so you see this. Let's proceed further. And by the way, by the way, let me explain you one thing. What is Zarrat? What is Zarrat symbolic of? Now, Zarrat means infectious skin disease, contains leprosy. But, but theologically, there are two things in the scripture that, that speak of sin. There's Zarrat and there's Khametz. 
there is zarnad and khamets and they are talking of sin zarnad shows us how dangerous sin is the destructive power of sin the power to com completely consume us to destroy us so that is being shown uh, through zarnad lord our, our holy spirit our father is showing us how dangerous sin is through this uh, uh, horrifying disease so so this is the thing now now we'll let's 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 uh, read the next two verses uh, verses 8 and 9 and i want to show you something that 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 most scholars do over here and more importantly what they do not do uh, leviticus 14 verse 8 uh, the person to be cleansed must wash their clothes shave off their hair and bathe with water then they will be ceremonially clean after this they may come into the camp but they must stay outside their tent for seven days on the seventh day they must shave all their hair they must shave their head their beard their eyebrows and the rest of their hair they must wash their clothes and bathe themselves with water and they will be clean uh, now what certain what what a few uh, what certain uh, bible teachers the commentators they do is what they do actually is they they re they focus only till the ninth verse they are so fascinated with this awesome ritual that they do not see uh, beyond verse 9. Now verses 8 and 9, uh, some scholars, they, they say that this is representing or symbolizing that which happens in the life of a believer after he's born again. And he, they say that this is uh, uh, just like what is mentioned in Romans 6. Romans 6, we are a new creation, we are in Christ. And, and uh, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Ruach. And, and there are various passages throughout the epistles in the Brit Kalasha that speak of uh, uh, the growth that needs to take place in terms of sanctification and the, and the decrease of sin in our lives. So they feel that this ritual, the shaving off and the bathing and, the, and washing the clothes is representing sanctification, representing that which is written in Romans 6. Uh, what actually is happening over here, you need to understand brothers, is that what, when you realize, the, many people don't go beyond verse 9 because they, are, they, are, they, they focus so much on the two words. But if you study carefully, up until verse 9, the atonement doesn't take place. Atonement is not happening. Atonement happens in, in verses 18, 19 and 20 for, uh, the, uh, for the person who is, who is not poor. And for the poor person, you find atonement being spoken of in verses 21, 29 and 31. Of, Luke, of, of, of Leviticus 14. And you also find that although it says that he's clean over here, the cleansing process also is mentioned that there is still cleansing that needs to be done. It is mentioned in verses 14, 17 and 18. What this needs to, what you need to understand from verses 8 and 9 is that uh, during the wilderness, during the, uh, the, uh, the Israel, when the Israelites, when our ancestors were in the wilderness, Hashem Adonai, the Shekhinah glory, the glory of God was dwelling with them. Lord Hashem tabernacled with our ancestors. He was present with them. And in no way, no way would a person having Zarrat be able to go near the tent of the meeting. Not, not only could a person having Zarrat not go near the tent, anywhere near, not inside, near, but he could not even be within the camp. A person suffering from Zarrat who was an outcast would have to stay outside the entire community. You understand that, uh, you, you find that in Numbers chapter 5, you find that in Leviticus 13 verse 46, when Lord in Luke 17, he's entering one of the villages, you read that carefully, he's entering, so he hasn't entered and there are 10 lepers at a distance. But why are they? They are outside the village. Uh, so there you see there, there are lepers over there, outside, uh, they are staying outside the village, outside the town. Uh, Matthew, Matthew 8, Mark 1, and, and Luke 5, this is this amazing passage uh, about Lord healing a person uh, having Zarrat. We are not going to be focusing on that because our main focus in, is Leviticus 14, but Lord willing, we, we, will be take, we may take that uh, passage as well. Amazing treasures over there, uh, gems in that passage of Matthew 8, uh, Mark 1, and Luke 5. And, and if, you, if, you, if you understand uh, the Jewish history, this entire ritual that is given in Leviticus 14 verses 1 to 32, it was uh, Leviticus 14, it was never uh, it was never implemented until Christ healed the person having Zarrat mentioned in Matthew 5 and the other uh, 
in, in Mark 1 and Luke 5. In Matthew 8, Matthew 8, Mark 1 and Luke 5. That is when lo it is Lord who, who, who uh, cures uh, uh, the person having Zarrat, one of the messianic miracles. And that is when he goes to the priest and that is when this ritual is actually done. And the ritual is not just till 9th verse, it is till the 20th verse. Which we will understand some very important things that are yet to happen. So you understand, even in Beth Melachim chapter 7, Beth Melachim chapter 7, uh, you find the lepers who are outside the, the city gate, they are the ones who are the first ones to enter the Aramean camp. That is, that is the reason, that is because they are outcasts, they stay outside the community. So uh, when, when our ancestors were in the wilderness, in the camp, the camp, what is written in verses 8 and 9, you need to understand their restoration happening in stages. Their restoration is happening in stages and you need to understand that atonement hasn't happened yet. Atonement happens later, so this needs to be understand, under, needs to be understood in, in restoration happening in stages and them being able to come within the community but not in the tent and later on would they be able to be part of the, the activities and festivities and observances. So that is something you need to understand. Let us, let us go to the 10th verse and onwards and see some amazing things that are given over here. Verse 10, on the 8th day uh, they must bring two male lambs, uh, one e lamb, a year old. Uh, brothers, uh, NIV has written they, you know, NIV is talking they, the per, uh, but, but other versions they have on the eighth day, he must bring. So that is what the NIV has done. Some NIV Bibles you find, they have written he. Uh, on the eighth day, he must bring. So I just want to tell you for your information. Okay, on the eighth day, they must bring two male lambs and one e lamb, a year old, each without defect, along with three tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering and one log of oil. The Kohen who pronounces them clean shall present both the one to be cleansed and their offerings before Adonai at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering. Along with the log of oil, he shall wave them before Adonai as a wave offering. He is to slaughter the lamb in the sanctuary area where the sin offering and the burnt offering are slaughtered. Like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It is the most holy. Okay, uh, the, the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. Okay, so what is happening over here brothers? This is the process that is given, the procedure that is given uh, for the guilt offering. And you understand that the, that the blood of the male lamb given as guilt offering is applied on the uh, ear lobe. Some versions have the cartilage, the, the, the ridge. Some have the tip of the ear. Uh, you know, so, so, so some have cartilage ridge. So, so it is applied here, but here over here it's applied. And uh, we'll take the ear lobe. So, so the blood is applied on the ear lobe or the ear cartilage of the ear, on the uh, thumb of the right hand and on the uh, big toe of the right foot so the blood is applied and and we will be understanding what this is symbolizing for for, for us to understand let's read a little further uh, verse 15 says the kohen shall then take some of the log of oil pour it in the palm of his own left hand and dip his right forefinger into the oil in his palm and with his finger sprinkle some of it before adonai seven times the priest is to put some of the oil remaining in his palm on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot on top of the blood of the guilt offering. What is happening over here brothers? The, the oil is taken and it is applied on those three places, on, on the three portions of the body and then, and then the rest of the oil in his palm, the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed and make atonement for them before Adonai. So they are applying the oil on top of the blood, uh, on the ear lobe, the right, right thumb and the big toe of the right foot and the remaining they put on the head. What does oil represent in the scripture? Oil is being used as a metaphor, as a type for something. Oil is used many times, not always, but many times for the Holy Spirit, for the Ruach HaKodesh. 
there are other types you find that that are used for the holy spirit there are other types other metaphors but oil is very strongly not always but quite a few times used for the ruach hakodesh when brother brothers when we were baptized in christ we died with christ when we were baptized we died with him and when we understand what our lord has done for us on the cross and we accept that his blood is the only thing that that cleanses us of our zarrat that his blood is the factor if you accepting or not accepting his blood is the factor based on which your eternity the spending of your eternity will be decided so when we accept lord yeshua sacrifice that he died for our sins we are born again we become spirit baptized and the holy spirit allows makes us to enter the body whose body christ's body so the oil given over here mentioned over here is representing the holy spirit our spirit baptism and the holy spirit's work in our lives that when we are born again he makes us to enter the body of the messiah and the blood over here is representing the blood that christ shed and that we understand that it is the only way we can spend all eternity with our lord we receive salvation through him alone so the blood is representing the blood that was shed and the oil over here is representing the work of the ruach spirit baptism entry into the body first corinthians chapter 12 you see the photographs over here of kept of oil and first corinthians chapter 12 we were all baptized by one ruach so as to form one body whether yehudim or goim slave or free and we were all given the one spirit to drink the one spirit to drink means the indwelling of the ruach This ritual over your brothers is the most amazing graphic display of that which happens after Lord gives his life after he has resurrected to be precise it starts from Acts chapter 2 when the holy spirit was given this is amazing what an amazing ritual and you will you do not find brothers uh, uh, explaining or interpreting or unlocking this ritual this is awesome this is amazing right here in the tanakh in in the torah in the middle of the torah in vayikra and what you see here is when you read further you realize you in the 18th verse when we read the 18th verse there you find atonement being spoken of now atonement is happening in verses 8 19 and 20 also when the sin and the burnt offering along with its grain offering are offered that is when atonement takes place atonement does not happen uh, uh, in the first nine verses it does not happen your atonement takes place and if you study the scripture diligently if you study yeshayahu 53 which we have explained in in, in our uh, series the mashiach ben yosef series where we have uh, explained the uh, servant songs uh, by yeshayahu and where we uh, the fourth song where we enter the heart of the tanakh we have explained that asham is mentioned over there there are some versions who have mentioned it as it as sin offering but it is actually a guilt offering asham our lord our redeemer be in the guilt offering guilt offering asham over here is explained in absolute detail this is amazing this is here atonement is happening and uh, let, let's read uh, 19th and the 20th verse which says uh, the kohen is to sacrifice the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from their uncleanness you see again the cleansing is is happening it doesn't end at verse 9 Uh, after that the priest shall slaughter the burnt offering and offer it on the altar together with the grain offering and make atonement for them and they will be clean here you find atonement being completed lord yeshua is the guilt offering he is the sin offering he is the one who was burned who was crucified outside the city which i'm going to get to in just a few a uh, few minutes in few seconds and he is the burnt offering he was so horribly marred he was so horribly tortured beaten he did not look human anymore when you when you offer a burnt offering when you give a burnt offering you clean it and you offer it to the lord burnt offering only in case of a bird you remove its crop and then you burn it you give it as a burnt offering if in for for a bull or for a sheep or a lamb uh, or a goat you give it you clean it and it's given to the lord in that way lord yeshua was not only the guilt offering but also the sin and the burnt offering where he was so horribly beaten he did not look like a man it was a burnt offering the the complete the he was the prophetic fulfillment of the burnt offering 
So here we understand atonement doesn't happen uh, in the first nine verses. And here we understand that uh, uh, atonement happens when these three offerings are given. Now, brothers, now uh, again getting, like I said a few minutes back, that we will get back to the ritual of the two birds. Uh, when you read this chapter, and when you read and you start reading uh, regarding Zarrad of the house, or the house containing defiling mold or mildew, or, or mildew, uh, uh, and it is, it is later on it's cleansed, uh, it becomes clean. It, the ritual that is done again is of the two birds. Let me let me read Leviticus uh, chapter 14, the 53rd verse. What it says is, then he is to release the live bird in the open fields outside the town. In this way, he will make atonement for the house and it will be clean. Now what is happening over here, brothers? The same ritual is done for the house as well that is found to have been cleansed of zara or mildew, or defiling mold. The same uh, ritual is done. Uh, so, but when you study the scriptures, when you study the Bible, you realize that Yeshua Hanazarati did not just die for our sins, he also died to redeem his creation. Romans chapter 8, that the, the creation is groaning, is weeping, is crying to be delivered from the bondage of decay into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So when this, this year, the releasing of the bird, this is Christ, and I will explain you the connection of Christ and Barabba, I will be explaining you right now. This over here, you find that he is, it is representing and symbolizing the redeem, redemption of the creation. And in the Zarrat of the person, it is symbolizing mankind. And when you read the 53rd verse, this, this ritual for the house, you, th you see that at first glance, it seems uh, just sim very similar to uh, the ritual in the first seven verses. It's, it's, this, it seems to be the same. It's not exactly the same. What is happening, you need to understand that here, the live bird, it says, then he is to release the live bird in the open fields outside the town. What is happening uh, in this situation here is that the sprinkling that is done is done inside the town, inside the city. The house is inside the town, inside the city. There the sprinkling is done. The bird is slaughtered over there inside the city. But then he comes outside the town and then he releases the bird. When you go to the first seven verses, you realize that he's already outside the town. Why? Because the person having Zarrat cannot come within the camp or within the city. So the Kohen goes there, he does the ritual outside the town and there he releases. If you understand outside the town, outside the city, the, the, this phrase, if you understand from the Brit Kadasha, you, you will remember, you will realize uh, that the writer to the Ibrim, he, he makes a very strong case, he, he makes a case of going outside that we need to go outside the camp because our Lord was crucified outside the camp, outside the city. The, he is the sin offering that was that was that was burnt. It's the sin offering burnt outside the camp at a ceremonially clean place. So outside the town, which is written over here, we understand that the bird being released. Of course, Christ was crucified, and the bird here that is being released, uh, which was slaughtered inside the town. And for the first seven verses, even the bird was slaughtered outside the town. The bird is released here. You find outside the town, and there's another thing over here, brothers that some people completely miss, that here atonement takes place. Atonement does not take place in the first seven verses or the first nine verses of this chapter. Zarrad of the house, atonement takes place uh, in, the, in the bird ritual. But Zarrad for man, atonement doesn't take place until the 20th verse. Everything that is done until the ritual that is done, the sacrifice is done on the eighth day. So that is very important to understand. Now, one might wonder that how can, how can the bird that is released be Christ and then at one point I said he, he is Barabba and we are the Barabbas. How could he be both? You need to understand brothers that there are millions, billions of believers, uh, Messianic Christians, believers in the body. There are millions, there are so many different people from different countries and tongues and nations all uh, in the Mashiach, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, 
uh, circumcised, uncircumcised, Scythian, barbarian, no matter who, if they accept Yeshua as their savior, they, they, uh, they become a believer, they are born again. So there are so many Barabbas, but all are part of a body, one body, whose body? The body of Christ. So although there are millions and billions, praise the Lord, they all form one body. The body of the Mashiach. And the, and the bird that is released, when you, when, you, when you have a bird and you release it, it instantly it flies away from you, right away. And you understand that the rapture that take, takes place, according to 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye or even faster, the rapture will take place. Now the bird doesn't fly that fast, but it's symbolizing it just run, it flies away from you. It's the body of the Mashiach. So many scholars, they focus on the aspect of uh, the word being Christ, but they miss out it being the body of the Mashiach. And, and there's another very important verse, brothers, that people completely, that, that no scholar focuses on, is that which happens in uh, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, where we understand regarding the, the, uh, the woman and the dragon, and there is something amazing that is given over there. Let me read that verse. Now, there's a lot that is happening over there. We are going to be focusing that which is connected to, to this uh, session, this topic. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12. We'll read uh, verses 3 to 6. Uh, verse 3, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Amen. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Brothers, what is happening over here? The woman, you know, the, who is the woman representing? The woman is representing Israel. It's not the church. The woman is pregnant. The church is not pregnant. The church is not pregnant. Church is the virgin bride. You need to understand that. Some people feel that the woman is the church. No, the woman is Israel. And she is pregnant. And the dragon is, of course, Satan. But when you study this, you, you realize that, that uh, the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child. Who is the child? The child is Christ. Now, now, child grows up, has his ministry, he dies for our sins, he's resurrected and he's ascended. The Lord becomes flesh. The word becomes flesh and tabernacles among us to give us salvation, to, to save mankind. So what is happening over here is the scholars feel when it says, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. They feel that this is talking about the ascension of Christ. This, this, this is talking to some extent the, the ascension of Christ, but there is something way more that it is talking about that most scholars, most commentators miss. This is talking about the, the body of the Mashiach being, being snatched. The word used for snatched up, the word used in the Greek is herpaste. And it comes from the root word of harpazo. And the church is going to be harpazoed, taken away. Snatched. And that is what is mentioned over here. Although it says, and her child, the child was snatched, what child ascended, and his body, the church will be will be snatched, harpazod. And when you understand, and this is very clear based on what the passage is speaking, because as soon as the child is snatched up, you see the woman into the wilderness. After the rapture happens, there is an undisclosed timeline. There is an undisclosed timeline and then the 70th week of Daniel begins. And then the entire scenario, it unfolds. So you understand the woman that, that flees, that, that runs away into the wilderness is Israel. And that is happening in this passage. And, and eschatologically, this is the way the things unfold. The rapture, the undisclosed timeline, the 70th week of Daniel. And the woman is Israel, and the child is not just the ascension of Christ, it is the harpazo of the, of the ecclesia. 
so here you understand it is like the 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 verse is a two edged sword verse and the same thing is happening in the ritual of the two birds where the bird people feel it cries but it is also the body of the mashiach it's a two edged sword the ritual the the bird the live bird that is released and it is flying it is released the focus is not only on ascending of course it is also on release release and it is flying it ascends it is the body of the mashiach and here in the end and one more thing brothers before i forget there are some people who connect the two birds of leviticus 14 with the two goats of leviticus 16 now i strongly recommend you all brothers and sisters to watch our video uh, video session which is uh, which is regarding leviticus 16 and it is named the mystery of azazel are the two goats the same as the two birds are they the same are they similar or they are are they different you need to watch that you, we recommend you to watch that video and you and there are certain things that we have revealed through lord's help that you will not find anywhere you will not find and and we are we cannot do it it is lord's help it is the holy spirit who reveals it to our ministry to el shaddai house of bible learning So, so, so if you, if, if there are people who feel the two, go, two, two birds and the two goats are the same, they are representing same things, whether they are representing or they are not. You will let you, you will understand in the video of Leviticus 16, the mystery of Azazel. So here, brothers, we come to the end of this, this, this amazing topic. That is a a a graphic display. It's an actual visualization of that which happens. that is given in the new testament and everything is interlinked interlocked integrated when the ritual is not just of the bird the two birds but it is it is right up till the 20th verse and right here in the tanakh in the torah in the middle of the torah you find this ritual that is foreshadowing something that is given in the new testament it has a scatological focus and theologically so deep so significant There's such such amazing treasures and gems in the Torah. Uh, we uh, we we thank all our brothers, all our brothers, sisters who are praying regularly for the ministry, who are who are financially supporting us. It is because of your support, your financial support, and mainly because of your regular uh, prayers that we are able to do this. Uh, we thank you all with all our heart, and uh, very soon we will be coming with uh, with another. uh video very soon through lord's help and until then uh may may uh, may lord's peace may the shalom and joy of our heavenly father abba abba he is abba bar you know uh, uh we the, the current time the present sufferings cannot can be compared to the to the glory that will be revealed in us and all of this is because of abba's only son our lord he is the one who cleansed us of our zarat we all had zarat don't think we did not have leprosy we were all lepers he has cleansed us so may the the joy and shalom of our heavenly father abba be with you all in the name of his only son our redeemer our savior his blood only has cleansed us uh, he has bought us out of this world our lord our redeemer the, the lord of lords yeshua hanazarati in his name in his name only in the name of yeshua hanazarati amen